Lights, camera, action. Welcome back to the Oscar Real Movie Podcast with your hosts Haley and Matthew Schmidt. Uh, we've got a great episode today. We will be talking about the Best Picture winner from 1987, The Last Emperor. We also have our standbys of what we're watching or reading or whatever. We've got the trailer park, some news, we've got some real justice. Um, and stick around because we have got another top five list today. Perfect. Should we get into what we've been watching, reading lately? Yeah, let's do it. Not, I mean, not reading for me because I only read comics and there have been no new comics. So yeah, who wants to go first? I can start us off. Okay. Um, I have been getting ready for the newest season of Below Deck Med to start on Bravo next week. It's not a doctor show like it might sound sometimes. It's about a yacht crew on the Mediterranean and I love it. <laughs> and so I've been binging all the old seasons to get ready for um, season five to start next week. So how these people are just ridiculous the crew because they like it follows the crew <laughs> it's probably why they have a show <laughs> i know it follows like the crew that works on these luxury yachts and then of course like these people who are spending you know hundreds of thousands of dollars to you know vacation on these yachts like in the mediterranean and it's um i don't know i love it it's fun so i've been watching that in my spare time yeah no, i mean it's probably why they have a show imagine if they had a show on us during like this pandemic and how uninteresting that oh, show probably so would be. Oh, so uninteresting. It would be terrible. Yeah. Yeah. It's always cool seeing um, like the locations that they're in and stuff. I think this year they're going to be off the coast of Spain. So that should be kind of cool. So I've been watching that. And then you and I have been watching Shit's Creek. We finally started that. I've been wanting to watch that show for a long time. And finally said, quarantine, we need like a comedy to get through. So let's watch this. The dog is being really obnoxious right now. Sorry if you can hear Shocker. him. Shocker. <laughs> uh, yeah, that Shit's Creek. It's on Netflix right now. We're in the yeah fifth season right now, and mm -hmm. uh, I think this I think the fourth fifth season is when that show really got mega popular. I think at first it was like, oh, this is pretty good, but it got very popular right around the fourth fifth season, and then you know going into the finalist season, so. Before we know it, we'll be done watching this, and then we got to find another new thing to, <laughs> to binge. I mean, this is pretty easy. It's like 12, 13 episodes a season. Each episode is like 20 minutes long, so mm -hmm. it's very easy to binge. So if you haven't watched it, uh, I would highly recommend it. Pretty much anyone can watch it because it's on Netflix, and at this point, everyone has Netflix. So <laughs> Yep, exactly. So, um, but yeah, it's created by Eugene Levy, you know, the, the dad from the American Pie movies. Mm -hmm. He's done a number of other things. He and his son, Daniel, created it. And the two of them star as, um, like, father and son in the show. Catherine O'Hara plays his wife. The two, like, her and Eugene Levy have done a ton of things together. So um, it's fun seeing them again. It's just, it's a super rich family who moves to this podunk town. And it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's really funny. So we've been enjoying that for sure. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. What else do you uh, have on your list? Yeah, I'd say Schitt's Creek was on mine as well. I figured it would be on both of ours because yeah. that's the only thing we've been watching. <laughs> yep. uh, we, I kind of briefly restarted Avatar The Last Airbender, uh, which was a show I'd... It, was, it came out on Nickelodeon, which, you know, makes it seem like it's a kid's show, which it is a kid's show, but it's um, it was created... I don't know if it was created, but he directed a bunch of episodes. Dave Filoni, who did Clone Wars for... Disney, which just ended and was a huge success, along with Rebels, and now he's involved in The Mandalorian. Uh, he did Avatar before any of that, uh, so it, it's still really good, even though it's a quote-unquote kids show. Uh, it's still fantastic. It's only three seasons long. Uh, unlike uh, Schitt's Creek, each season is 20 episodes, so it's a you know a little bit longer a season to watch, but uh, still really good. That is also on Netflix. Uh, and then the only other thing I had was, I forget to do this, so I'm going to start doing it now. I read and will read 
a couple, we don't have a ton uh, of reviews, but a couple people have left some for us recently. So oh, I was awesome. going to read uh, one. Cool. Uh, who is from, uh, I actually, this is a, a fellow podcast uh, from uh, Watch If You Dare podcast, which they do movies as well, but they specialize in horror films. Very which cool. I listened to their episode on The Thing because... Uh, I don't watch as many horror movies as they do, so that's the only one that I, like, flat out had seen. Uh, they had done some other ones on movies that I planned to see, but I didn't want them spoiled for me, so I listened to their episode on The Thing, which was great, so check it out. But they wrote, uh, Oscar Real Movie Podcast has a tried and true approach to film podcasting, but it's, uh, incredibly executed. It's fantastic that the show has variety beyond just Oscar nods. In the form of trailer discussion and digging into the other movies, uh, must listen for movie fans of all levels. So appreciate that review. It was five stars, so appreciate that a lot. Uh, awesome. For anyone else listening, please you know leave a review on maybe your favorite or least favorite episode that we've done as well, just to help build awareness. But I appreciate that one from the Watch If You Dare podcast. So just wanted to give them a quick shout out. I watched a lot of movies. Leading up to this episode, which I can get into later, uh, just so I can have a better idea on doing a retake on the Oscar nominations, but we can get into that later. Should we hop into the trailer park this week? Uh, yeah. Okay. You should stop clicking on the title of your Word document. I keep doing that, and it keeps wanting me to, like, Rename title it. it. Yep. Anyway. Okay, so this is exciting. We actually have new trailers this week yeah doing this show every two weeks we kind of get more time for trailers to come out plus i mean most of these that we've been seeing are netflix because they're they're still punch they're, you know pushing out their movies yeah so. exactly um so this first one here is called the old guard and it's uh based on a graphic novel it stars Charlize theron uh chuatel edgia four and um, it's like a team of immortal mercenaries. Um, and it, to me, it kind of seems like Charlize kind of brings in like this new girl to the group. The feel I get from like who she is, how she's being brought in. Sure, yeah. So like you said, it's based on a graphic novel, which I've not read. It's from uh, Image Comics, which have done a lot of great stuff. Okay. They're, they're, they, they, Royal City, which we both read, was uh, Image Comics or... Saga is their big title, which is kind of on a hiatus right now. Uh, I read uh, Isola, which they've done. So they do a lot of great independent kind of work, uh, and that's where the the old guard comes from. It looks like the movie's kind of them bringing her on to the team and teaching her what's going on, and uh, it seems like they're kind of a hit team. They're mercenaries, they're warriors, so depending on the century or the decade, uh, that kind of changes what their role in the world is. So you kind of say that in the trailer, that sometimes they're good guys, sometimes they're bad guys. Uh, so yeah, that that's kind of what this is seems to be the premise on this. Like I said, I haven't read the comics, so I, I really had no idea about this one before seeing the trailer. Um, this will be released on Netflix uh, July 10th. I guess the only reason I would see it is because it's on Netflix and I want to see new new movies. But to me, this looks like it's probably a great comic, but to me, it may not translate to film that well. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't. We've seen the Immortal Warrior or Unstoppable Warrior type films before, so I like. I haven't read the comic. Maybe there's a difference in this versus other things and. Hopefully, if anything, it stays true to the comic to keep its fans happy. Yeah. But uh, I don't. This isn't anything I'm particularly excited about. When I first saw the trailer, I thought maybe it was some weird spinoff of Hancock. But I'm like, surely Stern has played an immortal person before, so that's, that's interesting. Yeah, I had <laughs> completely forgotten about that because yeah, watching this, I mean, she's kind of got the short hair again and just called me back to Mad Max Fury Road a little bit. I'm like, oh, I love that she's like continuing to play these like badass action hero type people but i have forgotten that yeah she actually plays an immortal type Person. action star yeah in a different movie so yeah i don't, I don't know it's i'll see it because it's gonna be on netflix and it'll be a new movie but i i'm not particularly excited about it hopefully i'm wrong uh they even do that fun trope that happens in a lot of action movies of oh wait for the signal well how do i know what the signal is gonna be Enter big explosion. <laughs> oh, okay, there it is, and move on. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. Hopefully it's different, and it adds, like, 
I had little to no expectation. Well, I was kind of excited for Extraction, I guess, but it was better than I expected it right. to be. Yeah. So hopefully this will serve that same purpose, but going into it uh, lower on my excited bar. Sure. Big director on the next movie. Huge. And that's, uh, we got a Spike Lee joint coming to Netflix again as well. Uh, in Da 5 Bloods, this will be released. <laughs> Could you be any whiter saying that? Da, da 5 Bloods. Yes. No. <laughs> Defy I am bloods. very white. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Sorry to make fun of you. No, that. that's fine. I uh, So yeah, this is a Spike Lee joint. It is about four African-American vets from Vietnam who return to Vietnam seeking the remains of their fallen squad leader who is played by uh, Chadwick Boseman uh, and the gold fortune he helped them hide. So I had no idea that Spike Lee was making this movie. You yeah, know, he's usually a pretty either. big name where I'll hear when he's making a movie or or in the works of something. I had no idea that this was happening, but uh, very excited because his last movie was Black Klansman, and part of me thinks that that should have won Best Picture oh, uh, yeah. the year it came out. Uh, so I'm very excited to see this. Uh, stars, yeah, Chadwick Boseman, like I said, which I assume he's only going to appear in flashbacks, which kind of cool. They look like they're going to be documentary-type style, at least the footage from the trailer. It looked like it was kind of in a, like a f different definition and, you know, had a different like uh, look to it, like a documentary uh, versus, you know, the HD quality present day uh, storyline that they were going to have. Delroy Lindo is in this and he, oh, he was in Cider House Rules. Oh man, our dog farted. <laughs> that smells great. Uh, he's been in movies <laughs> like uh, Get Shorty, he was great in, uh, Malcolm X, so another Spike Lee joint he's been in before. This looks looks good, I'm very excited to see this. looks a little different, it'll have a different tone to it, uh, at least the trailer made it seem that way, but what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, and I feel like Spike is really good at, at doing that kind of thing. <laughs> the dog is like smoking us out of our recording room right now. <laughs> Sorry. Oh my god, I can't help it though. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I I always like the style of um, flashbacks, like telling the story like between past and present, which is kind of a nice bridge to um, The Last Emperor that we'll be breaking down later today. But um, yeah, no, I think this seems fascinating. And he's great. Spike Lee is always good at finding stories that or like shedding light on things that people don't always think about or people don't always process. And I feel like you don't always see um, a lot of African Americans in, uh, especially in Vietnam. So I think this will be really interesting take. Like you said, there's kind of different styles between the present day and, and the past tense. So I'm super excited for this. Yeah, it's coming out in June already. So just a few weeks. Oh my gosh, yeah, this is coming out in like two weeks. It's coming out <laughs> June 12th. That's coming up so much faster than I realized but um and it's kind of cool that they're i mean it has like a very serious tone but it's kind of neat that they're going back to see if they can find um like this gold fortune which has a very like kelly's heroes kind of thing to it which i love so <laughs> the, the like side stories of war are always kind of fascinating you're like uh african americans in, in vietnam films there probably aren't a lot of them there probably are some and i just can't think of them or i haven't seen them but he's done something like this before uh in miracle at saint anna which was a film he wrote and directed as well it was released in 2008 and that was a similar idea but with uh world war ii and that movie you know, it wasn't critically received like you would expect a Spike Lee movie to be, mm -hmm. but I'm sure I have more more faith in this one, and I'm sure that this one will be great, and I'm very excited to see this, so. Yeah, ooh, it's coming in a whopping two and a half hours. Yeah, he, you know, I'm not too <laughs> surprised by that Spike Lee likes movies on the longer side. That mm -hmm. Miracle at St. Anna was 160 minutes, so that one's on the long, almost three hours, <laughs> Close and to three, yeah. Malcolm X was three a three hour long epic you know he i'm not shocked by that sure this is a good little link we're talking about spike lee and black Klansman. uh the star of the next movie of our next trailer is john david washington who is in black Klansman. 
Um, and it's a new trailer for Tenet. So the teaser came out, I don't know how long ago, but in Christopher Nolan teaser fashion, the first one never really explains a whole lot. <laughs> uh, it is literally a definition of the term teaser. But we got our full length trailer here. We kind of learn a little bit more, maybe come up with a few more questions, which is good, right? Like, I don't want to know too much going into a movie, especially because Christopher Nolan movie where you know you're, you're going to be, you know, your brain's going to be spinning <laughs> to yes. a certain degree. Yes. But uh, yeah, this is going to maybe not involve time travel, but time manipulation starring John David Washington, like you mentioned, Robert Pattinson is going to be in this. Uh, which I'm excited to see him in a movie again. I'm excited to see this. It's going to be in theaters, too. Christopher Nolan is big on, uh, you know, movies. The like the theater, theater experience. experience. Yeah, exactly. And at the end of the trailer, it says, will be coming to theaters. It didn't give a date. Right now, it is lined up to come out in July. But obviously, with everything, everything that's going on, that's maybe up in the air. But this is a movie that is not going to be kind of dumped on streaming. I don't want to say dumped, but like The King of Staten Island, it, that isn't going to be in theaters. That's going to be on demand and uh, Trolls, World Tour, you know, like all those things that kind of bypass the whole theater experience just to get them out there. Mm -hmm. That will not be the case for this. It will be in theaters, which I like. Uh, I don't know how quickly we'll go see it in theaters because we're kind of on the better safe than sorry side of things right yep. now. But uh, I'm glad that there's a big-ish time movie out there for when theaters do open up for people to go see because that's what theaters are going to need they're going to need that big draw uh to get people back to the theaters to kind of you know bring in the money keep them in business and you know with uh the biggest movie of all time endgame coming out last year not really having a big time superhero or comic book movie in your back pocket to open theaters up to yeah a big christopher nolan movie is probably one of your next best options so yeah for um, sure no that's a very good point very, actually very excited for this but what did you learn or what questions do you have on this movie after the trailer well yeah like you said it's it's maybe not necessarily time travel but like time manipulation because i i was kind of looking at like some of the scenes the lady like tells john david washington like shoot the gun and he, like, pulls the trigger at, you know, like, a little shooting range thing. And the bullet comes, like, into the gun. So I'm like, is this, like, backwards time travel? Or, like, you're saying is it more, like, manipulation of time? And it's, uh, yeah. It's one of those things where it's, like, it's given me more answers but also more questions at yeah. the same time. Like, how are they going to use this? How do they know they can do this? Mm-hmm. Which I'm, I'm glad I have that confusion. Yeah. Because oh, if yeah. I knew, I probably wouldn't be... You know, half the intrigue of going into a Christopher Nolan movie is going, like, what is this going to, like, how does this work? Yeah. Like, Inception, like, oh, it's about dreams. Well, how does that work? But I will say, I'm sure it'll be easily, not easily, but it'll be explained in a somewhat understandable way because while there's always that big question mark going into Christopher Nolan movies, I always feel like they explain it pretty well. Like, Inception, the idea of going inside a dream, inside a dream... It's yeah. kind of crazy, but the way that they explain it or that it plays out in the movie, it didn't seem complicated. Right. Like it was pretty easy to understand. Yeah. So I'm sure that'll be the case with this as well. We don't know what's going on now, but once we see the movie, we'll be like, oh, well, that's really cool. That makes sense. But yeah, I think time manipulation is going to be the, the thing, not so much travel. Like, maybe they say the word tenet, because that's the other thing in the trailer. They say, mm -hmm. I have a word for you, tenet. It can be used to open doors or close them. So I wonder if the word tenet is like the key word to use this time manipulation. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but then like you can use it to rewind something or like redo something. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and the word tenet itself is a palindrome. So that kind of fits with the whole like you can use something in a present situation, but also with time moving backwards at the same, same time. Thing. So... Um, yeah, I think this seems right up my alley. I'm excited for this. Yes. Very, and it'll be great excited. once it is safe and healthy to do so to go and see it in the theater. Uh, what do you have for news for us this week? I'm sure people have seen or heard, but the Snyder Cut is coming out. It will be released on HBO Max in 2021. Uh, so that, yeah, that, that was kind of announced recently-ish within the last week or so. 
Well, so help me with my understanding of this. Um, and also for maybe some listeners too. So this is, so Zack Snyder directed Batman vs Superman, right? Yes, and Man of Steel. Okay. And so like the idea is that supposedly he had all these ideas and he had his like his own version of it and the studio was like, um, yeah, no, we're not gonna do all these things. And people are like, Oh, well, supposedly like his actual version of it is out there somewhere. Let's release it, right? That's kind of been like kind of. So yeah, he did Man of Steel, he did Batman v Superman, and then he started Justice League. Uh, but it wasn't so much a they canned him type thing. He had a family tragedy happen, and he walked away from Justice League. Mm-hmm. And then the studio brought in Joss Whedon to finish it. Gotcha. Okay, so this is Justice League, not Batman v Superman. Correct. Okay, the whole time I Snyder thought it was, cut is I Justice forgot League. About that. Okay. Okay. Uh, so Joss Whedon finished. It was released. People thought it was okay, not great. But then it came out that, you know, Zack Snyder, he, he has hours and hours and hours of footage of this movie that he created, but just never finished because he had to walk away from the film. So people have been asking for that for years. I mean, what, Just Lee came out in 2017? And almost right afterwards, people started asking for, you know, hashtag release the Snyder Cut. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, But it's finally happening. Uh, they're saying it'll either be a four-hour film or a six-part miniseries. Oh, They haven't wow. really decided okay. on that yet. Okay. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of where we're at with it. And also, uh, a lot of the original cast said that they'll come back for reshoots. Interesting. Maybe, maybe not like live action, but for like voiceover stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I mean, I, me personally, I'm, I'm excited for it because... I think people rag on the DC movies a little more than they need to. Even Justice League in general. I mean, when it came out, it was like a 20-something percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Like, okay, this movie, it's not amazing. It's better than that. Yeah. Batman v Superman is kind of a mess, but I don't think it's as bad as like the 15 to 20 percent on Rotten Tomatoes. It, it is either. Uh, Suicide Squad is as bad as people say that <laughs> one. I don't need to talk about, but Zack Snyder didn't do that one. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited for it. I like the cast too. I think Ben Affleck was my personal favorite, uh, maybe not Batman, but Bruce Wayne and sure. Henry Cavill was great as Superman. Obviously Gal Gadot is fantastic as Wonder Woman. They're still making those movies. Uh, same with Jason Momoa as Aquaman. I think this is really great for... Ezra Miller as the Flash. Yeah, even though he's had some issues recently too, but him as the Flash and... Uh, was his name Ray Fisher as Cyborg. Like, those were two movies, that, or not movies, but characters they introduced in Justice League and got very little screen time. And from uh, what I'm hearing, they would get a lot more. Uh, they'd be more involved in Zack Snyder's version of this film. And if you remember, originally it was supposed to be a part one and part two release. Dark Side is, like, DC's version of Thanos, and he was the ultimate bad guy in this movie, but he didn't really get shown in it. But I'm assuming that, or I'm hoping that uh, uh, Zack Snyder just kind of makes this one four-hour movie and just makes it what his version of Justice League Part 1 and 2 would be so we can kind of get that closure on it because Mm -hmm. Ben Affleck, he's not going to come back as Batman in any future movies. Word is apparently like this is reinvigorating Henry Cavill and he might come back as Superman. That's not a guarantee. I hope we see a lot of Dark Side, which Zack Snyder has already said he will be in this movie. Yeah, I I mean, honestly, thinking about this, I mean, the, when we first started talking about this, I in my mind, I had always thought this is Batman v Superman. I'm like, the movie was fine. Honestly, I don't need to see anything else about it. But knowing now this Justice League... Like, okay, well, that would be kind of interesting because I did actually like that movie, but at the same time, it's like, I was fine with it how it was, so I don't know if I need to see any more. This could be bad. Like, people are kind of assuming it's going to be amazing well, and fantastic. Thing. Like, yeah. this could easily just be a bad movie uh, because Zack Snyder, he's done, he's done such... great stuff, but he's done bad stuff too. I'm just excited to see because it's something he's passionate about that he wants to finish. And that I'm just hoping it's something to have some closure on. Because I don't mind Justice League, but it was made with the idea that there's going to be a second one. But that just wasn't going to happen or isn't going to happen. So I just hope that this 
kind of puts closure to it. All right. Um, let's jump into our breakdown for this week's Best Picture winner. It comes from 1987, and it is The Last Emperor. It's a biopic about the final emperor, the last emperor of China. Oh, that's where the title that's came from. That's where the from. title comes from. Sometimes you wonder about the title. This one's pretty straightforward. <laughs> um, this movie was directed by Bernardo Bertolucci. Um, it stars John Lone as um, the adult Puyi and Peter O'Toole as his tutor when he was a boy. Those are kind of like the two main characters, more or less. They're like the recognizable ones. Yeah. I mean, Peter O'Toole, O'Toole people, you would know who he is. Uh, John Lowe, I really only know because he's a bad guy in Rush Hour 2. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. For whatever reason, that just always sticks out to me. Victor Wong is in this who, I mean, he's got a crazy filmography. He, he goes from movies like this where it's, you know, very much from his heritage and from his lineage where it's like, you know, Chinese history. But then he'll... It stretches it. He's in Tremors, and he's in Three Ninjas. He's the grandpa in Three Ninjas. Like, really, other than those, th- those three, I mean, not a lot of recognizable names here because it is very much a movie about Chinese history, and I think a lot of the actors are authentic in that sense, so it's not a lot of big-name people. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Um, so what's really cool about this movie is that it had nine Oscar nominations, and it won all nine. It was the first to sweep, like, that many categories since, what, like, the 50s? Yeah, I think, uh, think Gigi was the last one that swept in this, like, large number or maybe a Best Picture winner to do it, to Mm -hmm. sweep, which came out in 51, I think. No, something like that. But But anyway. I know Lord of the Rings Return of the King also did it, like, years and years later. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So up until this point, 1987, I mean, this was a huge winner. just swept everything. So of those... GG's 58. Okay. There. Thank you. Um, So the nine Oscars that it won were uh, Best Picture, Best Director, uh, Adapted Screenplay, Cinematography, Set Decoration, Costume Design, Sound, film editing, and original score. So we've got a little bit of everything here. You've got um, writing and directing, but you also have a lot of um, technical visual stuff in terms of uh, set decoration and costumes, but also with the sound and the original score. So with it being an epic biopic, it kind of makes sense. One, that was nominated for a wide range of categories, but also to win all of them. It just goes to show. Mm Mm-hmm. How well done it was. Yeah. And I think this is a movie not a lot of people probably know about. I know... I hadn't heard of it coming into this. Yeah. And I know when I hit my big, like, I'm going to try to watch every Best Picture winning movie phase in middle school, high school. This is one I... It was hard to find. Uh, you know, because it's not an American production. Yeah, it's game. Please tell the story about this. Uh, about like, how like I how... came to own it? Yes. Okay. Truth coming out right here, right now. I think Statue of Limitations is over on Blockbuster. Okay, I wanted to own this movie because I was in this, like, I just want to own every Best Picture winner, and I couldn't find it anywhere. I mean, this is pre-Amazon, and uh, eBay was probably a thing, but I, whatever, I was a kid. Couldn't find it in any store, any Best Buy, anything like that. The only place I could find it was to rent it at Blockbuster, so I 100% rented this with the intention of never returning it. <laughs> this was my way of buying this movie. So rented it, never returned it, got charged, went, hey, I own this movie now. Perfect. Um, so yeah, I had never, I'd never heard of it. Uh, watched it as a kid and kind of thought it was boring. This is over two and a half hours long movie-wise. And I think the version that I stole from Blockbuster shouldn't say stole, they charge us for us, but <laughs> right. is the director's cut, which means it's almost three hours long. Uh, so as a kid, I thought it was kind of boring, but rewatching it now, I mean, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but I, I, I like it a lot more now. If you want to learn something about Chinese culture, I would watch this movie too. Super because, fascinating I, in that aspect. Yeah, I had no idea who Puyi was and what went, what kind of life he went through because you think, oh, Last Emperor, but he was made Emperor at three, so... 
like, I mean, it's a very young age to be made emperor, but then because he's the last emperor, so many things happened in his life that affected him in different ways, so it's kind of crazy. Right, and you think about all the things that were just, I mean, let alone China, but just, like, the world, all, everything that was going on at the turn of the 20th century, it's like he went through so much, and... Like, two world wars, and then uh, the whole, you know, and during World War Two, there was a you know, Japanese versus Chinese war going on as well. Uh, that was somewhat related to World War II, but kind of its own thing at the same time. And then everything afterwards, too, until he passed away in 1967. Uh, just a lot went on in his life. So it's really interesting to watch happen. Uh, but yeah, here's a little, like, Robert Ebert uh, review excerpt. From, from like, Sis Siskel and Ebert? Yeah, yeah. You know, cool. Uh, he, he was notably uh, enthusiastic about this movie. He said, uh, Bertolucci is able to make Puyi's imprisonment seem all the more uh, ironic because this entire film was shot on location inside the People's Republic of China, and he was given uh, permission to film inside the Forbidden City. So that's something to note, too. This is the first feature film to be allowed to film like in the Forbidden City. So that's kind of cool. And then he says, it probably is unforgivably... Uh, Burgos to admire a film because of its locations, but in the case of The Last Emperor, the narrative cannot be separated from the awesome presence of the Forbidden City. So, whether that should add to your score or not, the fact that they're able to film in the actual Forbidden City and uh, it just adds to the like look and aesthetic of this film, I think it's pretty awesome. Yeah. So, why don't you kind of take us through... Um... Kind of like the different sections, the different timelines of the movie. Yeah, so this is a biopic uh, that it spans <clears throat> decades and decades. It starts with him as a, you know, three-year-old getting crowned emperor and then ending with when he dies of old age or whatever in 1967. I figure we can break this movie into like four or five parts. Mm -hmm. We can just talk through each part briefly and add any notes that we had on it and kind of go from there. So the first part is him as a baby or young child. Um, this part I like a lot because this is where you get a lot of that traditional Chinese look and feel to it. This is back in the early 1900s, so you get the cool, like, the different outfits, the, uh, big time traditions that they have going on, uh, kind of before the world wars happen and, uh, you know, they, they start changing their traditions to more modern things. You get the mm -hmm. old school stuff here. So I, I think more than anything, uh, I think that's really cool about this section. Uh, I love the music in it as well. It's kind of that sweet. I think it's like violin-ist type music. Uh, this is where you get introduced to Victor Wong, who again, he's like an advisor to the emperor. But it opens with <clears throat> the previous emperor was has died. A lot of speculation is he was murdered. Uh, or poisoned by his uh, his own eunuchs because the eunuchs are like stealing from the emperor uh, like artifacts and stuff to sell off for money and so they think the emperor was killed uh, because he found out about that and then so Puyi comes in he's three years old and he gets crowned emperor and it's kind of just I, I don't know how long it is but it's just this this little kid kind of running around trying to be a kid and being told by all these like older gentlemen or people being like, no, 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 this is how you have to act. You have to do this. You have to do that. So it's kind of the start of him being broken into these old school traditions of, um, of these people. Yeah. I, and I always think those things are interesting. Cause like you have heard in, um, you know, other countries, other civilizations of like these super, super young rulers. And it's like, they're finding this balance between, um, I'm just a kid, but also, they're the appointed leader of the country. Mm -hmm. It's just like a weird contrast. Like you see him playing with like a grasshopper outside. And they're like, oh, like, see, this grasshopper is bowing down to you because you're the ruler. And it's like, it's just a kid playing with a bug. Like, you know, mm -hmm. so that's, it's always fascinating, I think. Yeah, I will say when, when he, <laughs> during this part, when he's like the baby and that transitions to him being like a six, seven year old kid, uh, he is a, a Boiled brat as a kid. I mean, part of that is like, oh, well, when you're told you're the most powerful person in your yeah. country, you get used to like, oh, I can do whatever I want. Yeah. Uh, because he, he finds out he has a, a brother, so he has his brother come and live with him. So it's like his friend kind of is someone for him to play with. 
and his brother is the one that breaks the news to him that China is actually a republic now. Mm -hmm. So you're not really an emperor. Though. Everyone in the city is kind of pretending that you're yeah. You're the emperor of the country. You're like you're the emperor of the Forbidden City. So if someone's in the Forbidden City, sure you're the emperor, but that's just this one little place. You're not It's really your only authority. Yeah, you're not like, you're not in charge of the entire country. Uh, so yeah, he's kind of a brat. He has a wet nurse still, so he's still, you know, he's sucking on that breast milk. Uh, shades of what Robin Aaron from Game of Thrones where it's he's, he's like 10 years old and still using a wet wet nurse. That part's a little creepy, and for whatever reason, when I saw this for the first time in middle school, this part just stood out to me and stuck with me in a weird <laughs> way, but uh, they had this old tradition where after the kid would take a poop, they'd look at his poop and determine whether his diet's good or not, so they have a scene of that, and that just stuck with me. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why. I wish I could get rid of it, but that just <laughs> stuck with me. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so he finds out he's... China isn't really, or it is now a republic, and he is an emperor of the entire uh, country anymore. Right. Yeah, so it, it flashes forward. Uh, he's, I don't think they give the exact age, but he's in that teenager uh, type phase. You know, they have different actors for these different phases. Uh, and this is when we get introduced to Pierre O'Toole's character. So with uh, the world changing, they decide to bring in a tutor of Western culture. So he's from, I think, London, but he's there to teach the emperor about, you know, the Western culture. This is, in this section, kind of, when he's a kid and baby, it's the old school traditions of the, that culture. This section is more so the breaking of that. So we're getting into more modern times here. So, so this is when uh, Pierre O'Toole's character, specifically, too, is telling the old advisors of the emperor like no listen he's we need to break him away from these old traditions this is a really old school way of thinking he needs to he needs to you know act differently and talk differently there's even a point where it's clear that the emperor is pretty much blind <laughs> like he's on a rooftop and he can't see and they're worried he's gonna fall off and uh rj who's Piero tool's character is like the emperor needs glasses and all the advisors throw a fit, and they're like, no, the emperor can't wear glasses, they can never wear glasses, can't do it. You know, it's kind of, things like that are where mm -hmm. these traditions start clashing and breaking a little bit. And part of it, too, is just, this is a young emperor, you know, when, if it's an adult, it could be a different story, but when it's a kid growing up in this situation, you kind of got to let him be a kid to a certain extent. Right. That's kind of something else Johnston RJ is getting at. The whole relationship with Pierre O'Toole is one of my favorite parts of this movie because, I mean, one, Pierre O'Toole is just a great actor, but seeing the relationship between Johnston and the Emperor is, I think, one of the best parts of the movie, and this is where you get the meat of it. He's in later parts of it, but this is really, like, the main part that Johnston shines, I guess, in the movie. Uh, this is also where the Emperor... He has to get married, so this is where he chooses <laughs> right. his wives. Uh, and, uh, you know, back then, you could pretty much have as many wives as you want, and he decides to have two. You, it's kind of wife A and wife B, though. Yeah. <laughs> one is going to be the empress, and then one is kind of like your, your secondary wife, I guess. And it kind of ends with, you know, him with that whole, like, the wedding and uh, and the three of them getting to know each other a little bit. Mm -hmm. So. Mm hmm uh, after that, it flashes to young adult. This is when John Lowe gets introduced. I mean, he does play the Emperor from here on out, so he does play him at different age points, but they just add makeup to him when he needs to look older and stuff like that. This is when we get introduced to him as the Emperor, uh, as that young adult, and this is very much the, the like, we are breaking off of old traditions phase of it. The previous one was the start of it, but this is... Like, the reform, he stops um, wearing the traditional clothes and starts wearing more so, like, the button-down shirt and pants and stuff like that. Uh, but this is also when he becomes, starts becoming paranoid and a little more power-hungry because, I mean, he was really only emperor for, like, three years of his life. Mm -hmm. And it was, <laughs> you know, his first three years or six years of his life or whatever. So he starts wanting to become emperor again. You know, he realizes that he's 
you know, outside of these walls, I, I really don't hold any power. So you kind of get that initial sense that he becomes a little power hungry. This is when the whole eunuch storyline comes up again. Uh, he wants to kind of get rid of them, get rid of the eunuchs, or he wants to bring them to justice or trial. And um, they set fire to parts of the Forbidden Kingdom to cover their tracks. It isn't really explicitly said. It's kind of implied that they did that. Um, but also at this point, around 1924, is when a new Chinese government takes over. So they were the Republic, and now a go new government takes over, and they actually invade the Forbidden City and kick Puyi out. So he's forced out of um, the Forbidden City, the only place he's ever been his entire life. His initial intent was to go to the uh, British Embassy and seek help from them because of the relationship with Johnston, but we find out that he actually goes to the Japanese because they also have an emperor that's kind of the same age as him, so he wanted to go to the Japanese to seek help. And we kind of learn this because this movie is told in flashbacks. Uh, it starts with him in like the 1950 or something like that. Yep. yep. And then it, it's told in flashbacks mm -hmm. while he's being interrogated by um, like Chinese uh, government officials because... He's Puyi is in jail as a Japanese uh, sympathizer because, like I said, they were at war at the time, and it's him telling the story of like what, how he came to be working with them. So yeah, that's how it starts. He gets booted out of the Forbidden Kingdom and goes to the Japanese for help, and then that's where the next storyline takes place, which is kind of his Japanese relationship. So he goes to different cities that are in China but under Japanese rule and like I said this is where it, he really becomes power hungry he wants to be an emperor again so he makes a deal with the Japanese that he would be uh, the emperor of Manchuria which was under Japanese control at the time and he would become a quote-unquote puppet emperor for them so he's really just emperor in name but He's willing to sign any agreement or do anything the Japanese say. His empress or wife at the time uh, starts feeling neglected and leaves him. And I don't know, just goes through this period of just doing whatever the Japanese say. They really breeze over it. Like, he gets that role of emperor in, I want to say, like, 1934, 35. And then it's 1945 is when he when the war ends is when he isn't <laughs> emperor anymore. So it's a 10 year period that they really breeze over. So you don't get a whole lot of what he does or, or happens to him during that time. All you're really told is he's his puppet emperor for this 10 year period for the Japanese. And then when the war ends, that's why he gets arrested and put in prison because he had this relationship with the Japanese, uh, which, you know, goes against what the Chinese believed in or wanted at the time. The last part of it is really not the last part of the movie, but what's been going on the whole time, and that's him in prison after that happens. So he's put in prison around 1950, and uh, he's treated, uh, I don't know, so uh, like one of the guards kind of likes him, but kind of doesn't like him. He uh, teaches him to kind of think and act for himself because his whole life he's had these servants do things for him, like tie his shoes and brush his teeth and while Puyi is in jail they're still doing that for him and this guard or governor of the prison recognizes that and has Puyi taken out of that cell and put in a different one so he can actually start doing things for himself so he kind of starts learning that and you know after all these interrogations and flashbacks kind of realizes things that he had done wrong and admits to it and signs all the confessionals or confessions to everything he ever did including things that he didn't do because of or, uh, good behavior and things like that gets released from prison after just 10 years something like that so he gets released around 1960 and becomes a gardener and really lives like a pretty blue collar ordinary ish life the rest of his life but happy you know he's happy in those times and the movie ends with him buying a ticket to the Forbidden City and going back to, like, the house that he lived in for almost his entire first half of his life. And, you know, it's weird to have to buy a ticket to your old house, but he does, and he goes to the throne room, and, 
you know, there's this little kid who, like, works as a guard, I guess, in the palace and goes, you know, you're not supposed to be there. And, you know, it ends with Puyi being like, this is where I used to live. And he shows the kid, like, the cricket uh, house that he had as a kid. And uh, the kid looks away and looks at the cricket. And when he looks back, Puyi just isn't there anymore, which is kind of weird. I don't know if that's supposed to be him as a ghost or something at the end. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, that's how the movie ends so it's this you know lifelong biopic from three years old to death in 1967 look at the last emperor of china which is you know a lot happens but i think it's really interesting you see him deal with being emperor at such a young age but then learning you're not an emperor anymore and you know, if you if you had if you're an emperor for that short period of time, it makes sense that you'd want to be emperor again. It's this thing you've been told your whole life you would be, but then you find out you're not it anymore. So the idea that he would try to be that again makes sense to me. So that that is an interesting part. Uh, I mean, rewatching it, I appreciate this movie and like this movie a lot more. I will say that whole third fourth act whatever it is where he's that whole japanese relationship that's where it kind of gets a little little boring to me i mean that's where it gets into the big political aspect of things which i understand it has to be there but that's where it got a little hard for me to follow because i just don't know chinese and japanese history that much so i felt i had to look things up uh you know keep, try to keep things straight like he's living in this city now oh where is it oh it was under japanese control you know i had to kind of look that stuff up to keep it straight and I don't know that's that's where it gets a little long and boring for me but I understand why it's in the movie I guess thoughts things about this movie did you have any things that you liked didn't like anything of note in that fashion one I think you did a really good job of summarizing everything because there's a lot that happens and I'm not always very good at summarizing stuff in a very linear fashion, so you did a good job with that, so thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, the style of it, I think, is what really helps kind of tell the story, because like you said, it takes place over his entire lifetime, and he's gone through so many changes and so many experiences, and so instead of just going day by day through those experiences, it takes him, you know, as this prisoner in... Um, you know, his kind of middle years and each experience that he has throughout that, he has a memory back to, you know, when he was six years old. He has mm-hmm. a similar experience when he was, you know, 10, 11 years old. And so I think that's a fascinating way to kind of skip back and forth and tell the story. And it gives a lot of good context for like where he is now and um, mm-hmm. kind of like the reason why he's behaving a certain way or thinking of a certain thing. And it's, Um, I think that was a really effective way to tell his story. And um, I don't remember if this was the director behind this or is the cinematographer. I mean, obviously they worked really closely together on this, but just kind of the different like color palettes and different styles they had for like each of the flashbacks, different timelines, I think just made the story just, it made it beautiful. Mm -hmm. And you say prisoner too. I mean, someone argue he's a prisoner like his whole life. Sure. Uh, I think, yeah, uh, no, for sure. I think uh, Reginald Johnston, RJ, uh, Peter O'Toole's character, I think he says that at one point, he goes, you know, the Emperor is the loneliest boy on the planet. He's a prisoner in his own house. Oh, so, yeah. And you, t- you totally feel that. And you're right. Yeah. Even at the end, like, the fact that he has to buy a ticket into a place he's, like, he's he's never free he's always got some sort of constraint on him yeah i mean when when he's a kid up until having to leave the forbidden city i mean he's just a prisoner in the city there's even a scene where he tries to leave and the guards just close the door on him like he isn't allowed to leave the forbidden city and then so metaphorically he's prison a prisoner there but then literally being a prisoner and you know from 1950 to 1960 or whatever yeah i mean he's in a way, a prisoner his whole life until the end, you know, where he feels free and he's a gardener and yeah, he has to buy a ticket into his old palace. But, you know, I think for the most part, he's considered himself finally a free person at that time. Yes, yes, exactly. He, I mean, he at least has some choice in his lifestyle and he's enjoying it. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, I've got some uh, movie trivia or rivia I've got here. <laughs> 
Uh, so... I think it's only a workshop that name a little bit. <laughs> I think I nailed that one okay. pretty solid. Sure. Yep. Uh, so as I, as I mentioned, yes, it was, it is, it's great. Uh, as I mentioned, this was filmed in the Forbidden City. Well, during filming, um, during the filming of this movie, Queen Elizabeth II was in Beijing on a state visit, and production was actually production for this movie was actually given priority over her. So she wasn't allowed to go in the Forbidden City. <laughs> it's gotta be one of the few times in her life, yeah. right? The Chinese uh, authorities said that. She wouldn't be able to visit. They're like, no, they're filming this movie. Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, the director, uh, Bernardo Bertolucci, talked at length with Sean Connery about the role of Reginald Johnston. Uh, but Connery actually ended up convincing the director to not cast him, which is interesting. We'll talk about Sean Connery in a little bit, but he would go on to make a different movie, and he won an Oscar for that movie. So uh, This is also the first uh, PG-13 rated film to win Best Picture. Oh, okay. Since PG-13 didn't exist until 1984 or something mm, like that. Yeah, that sounds uh, this, about right. This was the first uh, PG-13 movie to win Best Picture. That's so kind of cool. Yeah, and they they've kind of like gone back and like re-rated some films. And yeah, stuff, this is just but... off the original rating is cool. what that set is on. Good to know. Uh, and then the film featured nineteen thousand extras and nine thousand costumes. It was the first non-American, non-British made film to win Best Picture. Gotcha. Because you know, like Chariots of Fire was is technically a foreign film that won Best Picture because it's, it's a British British production. Made, yeah, very cool. Mm-hmm. Good facts. Um, Mivia. Mariv- <laughs> Marivia, you mean. Good Marivia. Oh my god. Um, I'm going to ignore that for a little bit. <laughs> um, you know, one thing I read too was, because uh, yeah, a lot, I mean with um, Bertolucci being an Italian director, I think the cinematographer was too. Like they obviously had a lot of um, Italian citizens on set and so they're filming in China and they said they imported like hundreds of pounds of pasta and olive oil and stuff like Makes that sense. for like feeding the crew and You know, we talk about all the extras and, um, I mean, they had so many costumes and wigs and it's, like I said, the, the scale of this movie is just like breathtaking. It's very cool. Mm -hmm. So what score would you give it? Ooh, are we doing scores right now? Ooh, is there something else you want to talk about before scores? Well, I thought maybe we could, before we get into real justice, we can talk about, um, like the other movie we're putting up against. Oh, okay. We can do scores then. Okay. I don't know. What do you think? So I, I don't want to give away too much for real justice. Let's, well, let's give the what score for for this movie first, okay. and then we won't give the score for broadcast news until after real justice. That works. Um, so I am giving this movie a solid 8.4. I think the scope of the story, um, like I love how it's told with flashbacks and present day. It skips to the future. You know, it just it it's it's such a fascinating story on its own. Like you always kind of wonder, like, oh, who's going to be the last person to do this or the last this? The fact that there's you know the final emperor and kind of his transition mm-hmm. into that, I think, was really fascinating. Yep, it's very much a epic in the sense, like Lawrence of Arabia type epic, spans over long periods of time and you know is kind of that biopic about one person. So. Uh, I definitely enjoy that about this movie. I, I like movies like that. So mm-hmm. I give this an 8.8. Uh, yeah, I think it's not one of my favorite Best Picture winning movies of all time, but it isn't one of the worst either. It's probably on the top half or third of like, this This is a really good movie, and I'm glad I rewatched it to get that different perspective on it. And yeah, highly recommend it to other people as well. I, before we get into real justice, we figure we'd do like a quick... 10-ish, if we can, minute review of what we're going to be putting The Last Emperor up against so that all the, everyone has kind of a, a decent idea on what these two movies are about. And that is Broadcast News. So this is a movie written, directed, produced by James L. Brooks. He was coming off a Best Picture win a couple years before for Terms of Endearment. Uh, he would go later on make movies like As Good As It Gets, which uh, won a couple Oscars. Uh, he did Spanglish, which did not win any Oscars, but it has Adam Sandler in it, one of his few dramatic roles. So, uh, so yeah, this is a movie. It's a uh, it's a love triangle that takes place at a news station while a like a, a big layoff is going on for that that company as well. So that's kind of like a slight back 
story that's going on. But yeah, it centers around three characters. The three are Tom, played by William Hurt. He plays the handsome but dumb news anchor to be. Uh, Holly Hunter plays Jane, who's like the direct and fierce upfront uh, news producer. Uh, and then Albert Brooks plays Aaron, who is that neurotic kind of funny reporter, field reporter character. Uh, so some quick notes on this. This is the third of the three consecutive Best Actor nominations that William Hurt had. So he won and was nominated for Kiss of the Spider Woman in 85. He was nominated for Children of the Lesser God in 86 and then nominated for this uh, in 87. So pretty good run for no William kidding. Hurt. No kidding. Yep. Very cool. For me to start in college, I, I was part of like the school news station where we would actually go out, find news stories in the community and actually run them like on a local network. And we would produce them and run them on campus. And I was actually a producer for it. So I would direct the news, produce it. Like we'd rotate jobs, but I actually did this. And most of our equipment was from the late 80s. Yes. So, I can, so I can heavily relate to this movie and what was going on about it. You're pulling tapes out of VCRs and shit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, oh my god, that's hilarious. <laughs> so I like a lot of the kind of inside baseball moments of this movie where I get the beginning, Aaron says something like, did you see they ran the wrong graphic on this news station at this time? And I'm like, I can 100% tell you that that happens. Like our teacher would say like, oh, did you see the Channel 5 News or whatever last night? They had the wrong graphic up. Like that's something that people 100% do mm -hmm. uh, in the industry. So I, I like stuff like that when they just talk about it, but they don't explain it. You know, that's kind of fun humor for the people who kind of get what's going yeah, on. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say, well, and it was really cool because I did one time like see you, you know, behind the scenes doing your news producing uh, in college, which was super cool. Um, but with that being my only real experience, like they get into it enough for like, like you said, people like you, like you really appreciate all that stuff, but they don't go in so deep that someone like me who doesn't know much about it is like completely lost. Like you understand like the intensity of, you know, some of these situations and, oh, quick, can we put this in the background and quick do this voiceover and now, okay, we got, you know, Joan Cusack freaking runs through the office yeah. delivering tape across Love that, the, the stress oh where like they're God. recording a quick clip for the news yeah. and they have to get it done in like 10 seconds. Uh, because, yeah, in college, we would try to pre-record it so we wouldn't have to go live or anything. But I right. did have to direct or produce uh, one time where we had to go live. And that is very stressful, you can imagine. I mean, if someone does one thing wrong, it's live and people are watching. So <laughs> definitely stressful uh, situations. Uh, I can say I totally forgot Jack Nicholson was in this movie because yeah. he's in a lot of Mel Brooks. Uh, not Mel Brooks, sorry. <laughs> James L. Brooks movies. Uh, two of his Oscar wins are in uh, James L. Brooks movies. I mean, he won for Best Supporting Actor for Terms of Endearment a couple of years earlier, and he would win Best Actor for uh, As Good As It Gets in 97. So he won Oscars for like working with James L. Brooks, so that's really cool but yeah he plays like the the top like anchor man for the new station uh, mm -hmm. and i totally forgot he was in this so yeah so what did you like or dislike uh, about this movie well i i think the like the opening scenes kind of uh like st set the stage for who these people are and kind of how their personalities match their occupation because it starts with um william hurt's character of tom like, talking to his dad, you know, back in the 60s, he's like, Dad, I, I try so hard at school, but I keep getting all these C's, and, oh, I just don't know what to do, and, but, man, wasn't that weird, and all the, all the ladies in the cafe were telling me how cute I was, and then just, on the bottom, it says, like, future news anchor, it's like, oh, okay, so he's a pretty boy, got it, and then they show, um, you know, Aaron as a kid, and he's like, I'm 15 years old, and I'm graduating early from high school, and I'm smarter than the rest of you, and too bad, kind of thing. So it's like, future news reporter, and that's, like, Albert Brooks's character. And you got, like, a little, um, you know, Jane is, like, a nine-year-old working on her typewriter, and her dad's like, Jane, go to bed, you're obsessive, writing all your pen pals, and she's just, like, so matter-of-fact, and, like, on top of everything, and she's like, here's what I'm doing, and so, like, I think it was fun to see, like, 
this has always been their personalities and like how it kind of led them all into like the same newsroom each with like their own like roles and stuff Mm -hmm. oh yeah great great way to set it up yeah and each one is like you know two three minutes like it didn't have to be a lot it was just this short little thing it's like already you understand who they are when they're adults like they're the same person basically Mm -hmm. um i mean i'm sure this is probably one of your favorites too when so Aaron has like always wanted to be in front of the camera like I can anchor I want like give me a shot at the weekend weekend anchor and so he's getting ready for that and yeah it's one of I would the say funniest things. yeah I'll say too because I know what you're about to say before that happens one of my favorite parts is when Tom because Tom and Aaron don't really like each other they're right. both in love with Jane so they're kind of fighting over her they don't like each other but when Tom is showing Aaron like how like tips on how to be a news anchor, mm-hmm. I thought that was pretty funny and pretty good. Like he's showing him tips, like here, do this, do that, and Aaron's like, "Oh, fabulous! What a great <laughs> tip!" Yeah. Which Albert Brooks, in case you don't know, is the dad from Finding Nemo. So yeah. just that voice, just picture that voice in this movie. He's yeah. had the same voice for years, and <laughs> it's funny. Uh, but yeah, the, the I mean, my the best part of the movie is the flop sweat scene, and that's I think what you were about to talk it's, about. Yeah, it's it's so bad. He gets his chance to anchor on the weekend, and immediately he just he starts sweating so badly, and it's soaking through his shirt, and the staff doesn't know how to handle it, and uh, you know he like ends the show or at least a certain segment by saying blah blah, blah and two hundred people died, and they're like, okay, cut, go to graphic. And he's like, and I wish I was one of them. Like yeah. he totally just blows it yeah so and it, like, i mean he does a good job like actually like, narrating the news and whatever just but the he's fact just that he's sweating, sweating. He's like so how bad. noticeable is this and he lifts his jacket up and his entire just... undershirt is just sweat and people are trying to use a hair dryer on him to calm down and then someone's running out of the background because they're about to go live again and they hit the background hanging art and so it's swaying in the background while he's live talking it's just a total disaster That's um bad. but yeah, i guess the last couple of things i have to talk about this i love a lot of the dialogue in this movie which mm-hmm. we'll talk about in real justice a little bit the humor is fantastic it's the best part of the movie i don't love the argument dialogue like whenever yeah. the characters are yeah. are arguing i really didn't like it like they were, I kept getting confused. I'm like, how does, you know, with her being the one in the middle, like, she likes Tom, but Aaron likes her, but she sees Aaron as a friend kind of thing. There are points where she's arguing both of them. I'm like, I don't even really understand what her point is. Well, in that, and also she'll be talking to Aaron, and they're, like, best friends, and they're talking, talking, talking. And then I felt like out of nowhere she would just start screaming yes. at him. And I'm like, wow, that is out of left field. Or Aaron is talking to her and says... You know, one day I hope that, you know, I have kids and we'll come and see you. And then uh, I'll tell that kid, yeah, look at that uh, fat, boring lady. And he just insults her, like, yeah. out of nowhere. I'm just like, where is this coming from? Like, mm-hmm. I get that they're all upset with each other because, you know, Holly Hunter's torn between Albert Brooks and William Hurt. And, like, they're both in love with her. But I just felt like the argument, like, they had a right to be mad at each other. But the way that dialogue worked in those arguments and how bipolar they seem just it didn't work for me and i didn't think those parts of it were good but the humor and the other dialogue in this movie is like at the news station in work environments and when it's humor was fantastic yeah so i would agree with that yeah it was that's, a good yeah good synopsis so that's that's what i'd say on it we'll give our score for this movie after real justice which will start right now why not perfect let's do it real justice all right so the first section we'll you know kind of briefly talk about and uh you know pick which movie we liked more in this is you know technical aspect may not be the right way to put it but i just think you know costumes cinematography the set decor like all of that stuff uh like which movie did you like more yeah which one i i I mean I don't know how you can't pick Last Emperor for best in the technical categories. Like, cinematography, the set design, everything was just, like, to the scale of this, you know, final empirical city. Like, it was just it was yeah. so cool. So, for me, Last Emperor gets his hands down. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty, yeah, I have the same thing. It's it's a new station versus set pieces and costumes that span decades and decades of a yeah. historical time. Yeah. Like, it's pretty... 
this one's pretty easy that it's the last emperor for mm -hmm. for sure so <laughs> moving on the next one i have music or score for me i picked the last emperor i felt like broadcast news had this kind of subtle like kind of rom-com light-hearted kind of music which is good it's there but for last emperor it kind of had this you know violin type music that was just kind of added to the epicness feel to that movie uh so i have the last emperor for the music and score as well yeah i did too um i mean this one was kind of tough but uh to choose to choose between but um last emperor i feel like the music yeah played more into the story um, I did love the music and broadcast news though, because like it's just like that fun poppy kind of like mm -hmm. here's the news kind of thing. It had like a jingle kind of tone to it, and like I found myself like whistling along to it and stuff. So, like it was fun, it was enjoyable music, but um, I think uh, how it works in the Last Emperor is just it's done better. Mm -hmm. For sure. So moving on, we've got writing we can do next. So for me, this one was. This one was actually kind of tough. So I mentioned I like the dialogue in uh, broadcast news other than kind of that argumentative scenes. Last Emperor actually won for writing. So th these were both nominated in different categories. Uh, Last Emperor was adapted. Broadcast news was original. Broadcast news did not win the Oscar for writing and Last Emperor did. Not that that really should matter. Right. Whether, whether you're judging, I'm just kind of letting people know that that's what happened. Uh, for me, I'm actually going with broadcast news. Uh, I think Last Emperor, I remember it more so for the spectacle of the film. Not so much the dialogue or the writing. Uh, I mean, it still has to be there for the movie to work. But I, the dialogue in broadcast news, I think, was just better. You know, the way they talked and, uh, you know, the, the way they talked to each other, the humor, the... The inside baseball moments around the newsroom, uh, while I didn't love the argumentative parts of it, I just I think the writing for uh, broadcast news is better. Yeah, uh, this was another close one for me too, because like you said, I I like the dialogue between the characters in broadcast news, but for me, I think just like the the depth and the scope of the story for Last Emperor um just uh stuck stuck with me a little bit more i couldn't think of the right word uh stuck with me so i'm going last emperor on this one that's totally fair the, the academy agreed with you on that so you know they're not always right but they're 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 right this time because <laughs> you agreed with them uh, good answer yep so the next one i've got for acting, mm -hmm. which which one are you going to go with? Well, you go I said first. broadcast news for this one. I mean, the three main characters are just... they The characters were fascinating, and I think they all played them very well. Like, each character had kind of their own elements that uh, were worth rooting for, but they also had their own flaws, and I think they um, just portrayed them really well. Yep. I, I also had broadcast news. I think this was other than the like the technical <laughs> section that we went over with first. I think this was the easiest one to yes. go with. Yes. All three of the leading characters in broadcast news got nominated for their performances in this. Uh, you know, best actor, actress, and supporting actor. All three of them got nominated. Versus, The Last Emperor actually is one of the few best picture winning movies to get zero acting nominations. A lot like Parasite just did that too, or yeah. Slumdog Millionaire. Those yep. are the three I can I can think of. I'm sure there are other ones as well, especially in like the 40s and 30s. Probably had a bunch of them too, but it's one of the few modern best picture winning movies to win without an acting nomination. Again, not that that should matter, but I just the there's just better overall acting that happens in broadcast news. That's what kind of carries this movie versus again the epicness and spectacle of Last Emperor. I will say Pierre O'Toole and John Lowe are fantastic in their roles. Those are kind of the two standouts for Last Emperor. But, you know, I mean, you got Joan Cusack along with Jack Nicholson uh, and, you know, along with the three leads in broadcast news, I think it's the clear winner. Yeah, exactly. So, let's see. I've got three picks for Last Emperor, one for broadcast news. Where yeah. are you staying? I'm, right I'm, I'm tied two to two, two, so I know we kind of do like this as a tiebreaker. 
Uh, it, it will be a tiebreaker for me. Mm-hmm. I know you've kind of already got Last Emperor, but you go ahead and talk to like which one you kind of enjoyed more to an effect anyways, even though um, we've already got three to one on Last yeah. Emperor. Um, for me, I, broadcast news was more enjoyable. I, I mean, that doesn't take anything away from The Last Emperor. I think it's still like a really enjoyable movie. Um, but if you're looking for something to just sit down and enjoy any night of the week, uh, broadcast news is just, it's, it's got its funny moments. It has serious moments. Um, it's just a great kind of fast paced movie. I like it. Yeah. With that being said, are you like okay with Last Emperor winning yes. Best Picture? Yes, 100%. Okay. Yes. Out of the two, like which would you have picked to win Best Picture? Yeah, Last Emperor. Last, okay. Mm-hmm. Because for me, I picked The Last Emperor as my tiebreaker of enjoyed more. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I laughed more at Broadcast News because it is partially a comedy and The Last Emperor is not. But I love the epicness of The Last Emperor and I love that it showed literally the entire life of a real life person that I really didn't know anything about. And they lived such an interesting and fascinating life. Yeah, right. That I did. I just really, I really enjoyed it. It is all, you know, it, it can get long at points, like in that, the political aspect of things, but, you know, I didn't love all the dialogue that happened in broadcast news. They both have pros and cons against them. Yeah. I did. I really liked uh, the epicness and spectacle of this country and culture that I don't know a whole lot about uh, in The Last Emperor. So I, I very much... I'm happy that it won Best Picture. So uh, yeah, I, 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 I would, too. I would pick that over Broadcast News to yes. win Best Picture. Yes, agreed. Justice has been served. Ching ching. Um. So what score? Now that we're done with real justice, what score would you give uh, Broadcast News? Um. So I give it an eight point three. I think it was a fun story. It was an interesting look, kind of inside the news world. Um. But I think the like the most fascinating part, like yeah, it's like a love triangle between these three people, but it was just cool seeing like how their personalities so well matched, um, like their career choices. And you know, at the end it like flash forwards to where they are in the future. It's like, they're all like exactly where they're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. I feel like. So, um, yeah, I just, I, it was a fun movie. And to, so for reference, you gave last Emperor an 8.4. Yes. 8.3 for broadcast news. So really close. Yep. Uh, I'm giving broadcast news. I'll give it. I was torn between eight point five and eight point six. I'll give it an eight point six because it was maybe that's some bias because I can relate to, you know, what the news like production crew goes through and mm-hmm. some of their technology as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm giving an eight point six versus the Last Emperor was an eight point eight. So these are the films. Of 1987, but the Academy Awards that happened in 1968, so the 60th Academy Awards. 86, you mean? You said 68. Did I? You did. (laughs) Way off. Yes, the movies of 1987 that took place in 1988, the Academy Awards did, and it was the 60th. 88. I said 86. Yes. (laughs) We're really screwed up. So to give some people an idea, these are some of the movies that were released that year. Uh, Dirty Dancing, Empire of the Sun, La Bamba, House of Games, Lethal Weapon, The Lost Boys, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, one of your favorites, Love Haley. Mm-hmm. Uh, Over the Top, Overboard, Predator, Princess Bride, Robocop, The Untouchables, Wall Street, Full Metal Jacket, Raising Arizona, uh, Jaws 4, Superman oh, 4, Jaws 4, uh, Spaceballs, oh, wow. uh, and Inner Space, which maybe not a lot of people have heard of, but I've heard of it. It's when, uh, Dennis Quaid gets shrunk down to a tiny, tiny person inside, uh, like a craft and then gets injected into Martin Short's body. Oh, okay. Yeah. I feel like I've heard of that synopsis Great before. Great stuff. Anyway. Uh, so yeah, along with some other movies that we'll talk about during, and, you know, like, yeah, I would say that's like everything. a big, big range of movies. Yeah. So, so, so people know I watched a lot of movies yes. for this year. Yeah. What do we got? Let's start in the writing category for like best adapted screenplay. What do okay. we got? Um, okay. So, uh, yes, like you said, uh, adapted screenplay, we have nominations for the dead Fatal Attraction, Full Metal Jacket, My Life as a Dog, and the winner went to The Last Emperor. 
So I'm fine with the winner for The Last Emperor. Uh, you know, we've talked about that movie at length. I don't think the writing is what makes that movie like spectacular, but I, it was really good in this. I would take out Fatal Attraction uh, and The Dead. I kind of feel bad doing it for The Dead because that was John Huston's final film. You know, he won Oscars for The like, Treasure of Sierra Madre and things like that. And this was his final film, so I feel bad taking him out, but I need to plug in William Goldman for The Princess Bride. Nice, okay. And then David Mamet is one of the best screenwriters of all time, mm -hmm. and it's criminal that he's only been nominated, I think, twice. Okay. Uh, and he wrote two movies that I think would be worthwhile for this category. For this year? Yeah, for this okay. year. One being The Untouchables and the other being House of Games. I'll give him the nomination for The Untouchables because I think that's a better movie. Okay. But I'm good with the winner being for The Last Emperor. All right, good. Um, we'll move to uh, original screenplay. We have nominations for Au Revoir, Les Enfants, which I think was like Goodbye Children is the translation. Uh, broadcast News, Hope and Glory, Radio Days, and the winner went to Moonstruck. Yeah, so I have, admittedly I have not seen a lot of these movies. I've only seen two Broadcast news, obviously, and then Moonstruck. Mm -hmm. Moonstruck is one of the movies I watched <laughs> to talk about these yep. Academy Awards. I, I'm not changing any of the nominees, but I liked the writing in Broadcast News more than Moonstruck. Uh, so I would give the win to James L. Brooks and Broadcast News. Have you seen Moonstruck? I have not. Okay, I didn't no. know if you had any opinions on this matter, so the only movie you would have seen is Broadcast News. Yeah, so. yep. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the change I would make there. Okay, so moving to supporting actress, we have uh, nominations for Norma Alejandro for Gabby: A True Story, Anne Archer for Fatal Attraction, and Ramsey for Throw Mama from the Train. Another Anne, those three Anns in a row. Anne Southern for The Whales of August, and the winner went to Olympia Dukakis for Moonstruck. Yes, so. Moonstruck, again, I've seen it. Olympia, she's fantastic in this. She plays the mother of Cher's character. Okay. Who's been in kind of a loveless marriage for most of her life. So she's fantastic in it. I'm not going to change the winner at all. I think she's very well deserving of that award. Uh, the only other ones I've seen from this are Ann Archer for Fatal Attraction. She plays the wife of Michael Douglas's character. Mm -hmm. uh, and then... I think it's just kind of funny that seeing Anne Ramsey getting a nomination for Throw Mom from the Train, which is a movie that stars Billy Crystal and Danny DeVito. It's a comedy. Yeah. It's just kind of funny seeing that she got a nomination <laughs> for that movie. Uh -huh. um, but I'm not really changing any of the nominees here, uh, partly just because I haven't seen a lot of them. But I, I have seen Olympia in Moonstruck, and she's fantastic in it, so I'm keeping her as the winner. Wonderful. Uh, moving to Best Supporting Actor, uh, we have nominations for Albert Brooks in Broadcast News, Morgan Freeman in Street Smart, Vincent Gardenia in Moonstruck, Denzel Washington in Cry Freedom, and Sean Connery won the Best Supporting Actor award that year for The Untouchables. So this is where I've seen all of these except Street Smart, which... Uh, I hear Morgan Freeman's the best part of that movie, <laughs> so I I get why he got nominated, and I'm not going to change that. I love Sean Connery. Uh, I feel like this win was kind of a career achievement type win, where it's like, hey, you you did something great that wasn't James Bond. Here's an Academy Award. We've talked about Albert Brooks and Broadcast News. Uh, Vincent uh, Gardenia plays the dad in Moonstruck of Cher's character. Okay. So I mentioned Olympia is in a loveless marriage. Well, he <laughs> is like the jerk husband who is cheating on her. Uh, and so, yeah, he that's his role in that movie. Watch Cry Freedom with Denzel. That's really his breakthrough performance. He plays Steve Biko, who is a, like a black uh, activist in South Africa in the 70s, which, I mean, South Africa, that's a tough place to be that, but that's what he was. And he's fantastic in it. The, the change I would make, I, I love Sean Connery. I love that he won an Academy Award. I would give him the nomination for The Untouchables. It's actually become notorious that he has a terrible accent, accent in that movie. Like, he's Scottish, and he's supposed to play this 
American Irish Chicago policeman and it's just it doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, so I wouldn't give him the win. I have a big pet peeve with accent, so that would yeah. probably be hard for me to get past. Yeah, I actually love Albert Brooks in Broadcast News. Like, I would give him the win over Sean Connery in this category. He's such a good character. We didn't bring this up during uh, our quick little breakdown, but I think my favorite moment of his, like, him preparing for the weekend anchor is funny, but I think the best part is when he's upset that Tom, like William Hurt, gets the lead anchor thing for the night and he just sits at home drinking <laughs> singing along to like french music and he's like he, look i can read and sing at the same time yes i would give albert brooks the win over he sean connery great, great job the there. only the only other changes i would make i would take out vincent for moonstruck I mean, mm -hmm. he's not even in it that much i just i don't know i, I don't love that nomination and then I had a hard time choosing between two people to give a nomination to. Okay. So one is Peter O'Toole in The Last Emperor. Mm -hmm. I think he's great in that movie and very much deserving of an Oscar nomination. But I'm not giving him the nomination. The one I'm giving the nomination for is R. Lee Emery. Mm -hmm. He's the drill sergeant in Full mm -hmm. Metal Jacket. Yeah, yeah. Like, he was a drill sergeant in real life, so I get he, it wasn't a stretch for him. But he's the most notable character and part of that movie. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I have not seen that whole movie, but you say that name, it's like, oh, I know who you're talking about. And I think you, someone could make a case for Vincent D'Onofrio in the same category as Gomer Pyle. I'd be fine with either of them getting the nomination, but I would lean towards R. Lee Emery. Uh, but I was, it was hard for me to not give Peter O'Toole a nomination for his, yeah. for his performance. But I couldn't think of anyone else to take out. Denzel Washington is phenomenal. As Steve Biko, and I haven't seen Street Smart, so I don't really want to pluck Morgan Freeman out of this. But I hear he's the best part of that movie, so I feel like I can't. Yeah. Okay. No, that's fair. Mm -hmm. uh, should we move on to Best Actress? Yeah. Okay, so the nominations that year were Glenn Close for Fatal Attraction, Holly Hunter in Broadcast News, Sally Kirkland in Anna, Meryl Streep in Ironweed, and then the winner went to Cher for Moonstruck. Yeah, I think this is, like, the easiest one. Cher is is the movie. Like, she is the best part of that movie. Very much well-deserving of that win. So not changing that at all. You know, Glenn Close and Fatal Attraction, that's a pretty iconic role for her. Uh, is but I'm not going to give her the win in that category. Holly Hunter's great in broadcast news, but again, I can't give her the win. Meryl Streep getting another nomination, not going to give her the win. Uh, and I haven't seen Anna, so I, I can't speak to Sally Kirkland that much at all. So Cher is hands down the rightful winner of this, and I'm not really making any other changes. Okay. Um, looking at Best Actor, uh, we have nominations for William Hurt in Broadcast News. Marcello Mastroianni for Dark Eyes, Jack Nicholson for Ironweed, and Robin Williams for Good Morning Vietnam. The winner went to Michael Douglas for his role as Gordon Gecko in Wall Street. Yes, again, an iconic role for Michael Douglas. I mean, he's great in that role. I'm not changing that at all. Oddly enough, he was in Fatal Attraction that year as well, so... Glenn Close and Ann Archer got nominated for their roles in Fatal Attraction, and Michael Douglas probably could have gotten a nomination, but, oh, at the same time, he was making Wall Street, which is maybe his best performance yeah. of all time. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm not changing that at all. William Hurt, he's great in uh, broadcast news. I haven't seen Dark Eyes, uh, so I was actually going to pluck Marcelo out, but then I saw he won, I think, like, Best Actor at... At uh, Khan, I probably shouldn't pluck him out. Even you know, I haven't seen this movie. Uh, Robin Williams, I've seen Good Morning Vietnam. He's the best part of that movie, and I love Robin Williams, so I'm not taking him out. I'm gonna take Jack Nicholson out for Ironweed. He plays a drunk, along with Meryl Streep, who plays a drunk as well. <laughs> and Meryl, she has so much depth, so much range. Yes, she <laughs> is phenomenal. Um, yeah, Roger Ebert wrote, um, Nicholson and Street play drunks in Iron Ironweed, and actors are said to like to play drunks because it gives them an excuse for overacting, <laughs> uh, or overreacting, sorry. But there is not much visible acting in this movie. Those actors are too good for that. So he was not a fan hmm. of their roles in this movie, 
and there's someone that I think did a better job. So I'm taking Jack Nicholson out. And I think John Lone deserved a nomination for The Last Emperor. He was phenomenal in it. And I, someone needs an acting nomination from that movie. Uh, it's yeah. too good of a movie to not have that. So I would take Nicholson out and put Lone in, but keep Douglas as the winner. Okay. Uh, moving to Best Director, we have nominations for Adrian Lyne for Fatal Attraction, John Borman for Hope and Glory, Norman Jewison for Moonstruck, uh, Lassie Hallstrom for My Life as a Dog, and as we discussed already, Bernardo Bertolucci won Best Director for The Last Emperor. So these last two categories are where I'm going to start getting some opinions in here. <laughs> uh... So Bertolucci, so just for the fact, Bertolucci, I'm good with winning. And then Last Emperor, I'm good with winning for Best Picture when we get okay. to that. But, okay. So for the rest of this, though, I'm t- I'm taking out three of the other nominees. Um, All right. I like Norman Jewison, and I liked Moonstruck. I think it's a very, like, fun and quote-unquote cute movie. It's, you know, Italians who fall in love and this, you know, that whole thing. So I'm keeping him in there. I, I, plus, I like Norman Jewison, too. He uh, he didn't win. He's never won an Oscar. But he directed the best picture winning in, in The Heat of the Night back in 1967. So he's great. But I'm taking out Adrian uh, Lynn, Lyne, John Borman, and Lassa Hallstrom. And the three that I want to plug in are, is Brian De Palma for The Untouchables. Okay. He's never been nominated for an Oscar. Some people call him kind of like a poor man's Martin Scorsese, oh. <laughs> which I think is... That's I think, sad. I think that's kind of an overreaction because he did Scarface, which people say are like him trying to do a Martin Scorsese okay. movie, but not as well. Yeah. I think I think he's a good director, and The Untouchables is one of his best films. So I plugging him in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm putting Rob Reiner in for The Princess Bride. Oh, nice. And then, so I took John Borman out, so he did Hope and Glory, which yeah. is. Very similar to Steven Spielberg's Emperor of the Sun, Empire of the Sun. Okay. Because they both involve like a child's or kid's perspective of a war that's going on. But I'm I'm putting I'm giving Spielberg the nomination for best director for Empire of the Sun. Uh, so yeah, I'm taking out Fatal Attraction, Hope and Glory, and My Life as a Dog, and then plugging in Untouchables, Empire of the Sun, and Princess Bride. Norman Jewison's Moonstruck stays there, and then Bernardo Bertolucci stays the winner for The Last Emperor. And then, last thing to note, this is the first time that all five nominees for Best Director were not born in the United States. Wow! Bernardo Bertolucci is Italian. John Borman is British. Lasse Hallström is from Sweden. Norman Jewison is Canadian. And then Adrian Lin is also British. Wow! So yeah, kind of crazy. That was very cool. So the Best Picture nominees that year were Broadcast News, Fatal Attraction, Hope and Glory, Moonstruck, and the winner was Last Emperor. What sort of changes do you have here? So Last Emperor wins. Keep it as a winner. Keeping Broadcast News. So I gave Spielberg the nomination for director. Okay. A lot of, I looked up reviews and stuff. People say that that Hope and Glory take a more whimsical look at the eyes of a war through a kid versus uh, Empire of the Sun, which I watched just the other day. Mm-hmm. I like that movie, but I just didn't love any of the characters. So it's about a kid who grows up, British kid, played by Christian Bale, who grows up in Shanghai, and then he's there during World War II when the Japanese kind of invade, and then a chunk of the movie is him in a... Like in a concentration camp the problem is i don't root for like any of the characters obviously like i don't want to see anything bad happen to this kid but he plays a jerk like a spoiled brat the entire movie until the end to an extent Mm -hmm. but all the other characters like john malkovich is in it uh joe pantoliano is in it all these other characters they're they're just i don't know i don't emotionally connect with any of them So I'm not really rooting for anyone. Yeah. So because of that, I can't give it a Best Picture nomination. So I'm keeping Hope and Glory in for Best Picture. And then I'm I'm taking out Moonstruck. I gave it the Best Director nomination. But again, there are some other movies out there that were released this year that I like. And then I think Fatal Attraction is widely overrated. People probably know what it's about at this point. I mean, Michael Douglas plays like a cheating husband. He cheats on his wife with Glenn Close, who... 
you know, then goes kind of crazy and tries to murder them. I mean, Michael Douglas plays this guy who cheats on his wife. But then by the end of the movie, you're supposed to, like, sympathize with them and root right. for them. Yeah. And I'm like, you did this. Like, you cheated on your wife. This is happening because of you. Mm-hmm. Why mm-hmm. should I be rooting for you? Uh, I don't know. I think that movie is very overrated. I've been removing it from a but, lot of these categories. I was going to say, I watched, I don't know, the last half hour, 40 minutes, which is, like, all the, like, heightened stuff at the end. And I had the same feeling, too. I'm like, I know I haven't watched this whole thing, but... I find it very surprising this was nominated for Best Picture. Like, it didn't have it a was, Best Picture it was, vibe to it. Yeah, it was a blockbuster hit. Like, it was, I think, the number two box office hit of 1987. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, let's see. Three Men and a Baby was number one. <laughs> and then Fatal Attraction was number two. So it was a monster hit, and I get it. Like, it, it does have that popcorn flick yeah. vibe to it. Uh, and I think the following year, like divorce rates and affair rates, however they would judge that, were severely down. Oh my God. <laughs> because, oh, like, oh, men were scared to cheat on their wives now. Well, just don't do it. And Glenn Close to this day says that she has women come up to him and say, you saved my marriage, which again, I don't think is like the healthiest <laughs> thing. I don't know. Don't like it. So I've been po- yanking it from all these nominations <laughs> as I can. Uh, so... The ones that I had a hard time choosing between, so just some ones to bring up here. Wall Street, I think, is really good. That's the better Michael Douglas movie. For sure. Full Metal Jacket is really good. My problem with Full Metal Jacket, which is Stanley Kubrick, Vietnam, you know, war movie. So I can't give it a Best Picture nomination, but the first half of that movie where they're in, like, drill school is phenomenal. Yeah. When they actually go to the war, I think it gets kind of boring. Mm -hmm. Uh, Empire of the Sun, which I brought up, but I'm not going to give it a Best Picture nomination because I gave it Best Director, and I'm going to give Hope and Glory that spot. But the two that I am going to plug in for Best Picture are The Untouchables and The Princess Bride. Beautiful. Like, I think Princess Bride is a genre or movie that doesn't get a lot of representation at the Oscars. No. But that movie is fun. Like, it's adventurous, it's funny, it has... It's gr- act- Yeah, like, I love I love that movie, and I think it should have gotten a Best Picture nomination. Uh, and then Untouchables, I think, that's... I love that movie so much. Robert De Niro as Capone, uh, and, you know, we talked about Sean Connery, but Kevin Costner in the lead role, like, all that stuff is great. So, Keeping Last Emperor is the winner, and then the nominees are Broadcast News, Hope and Glory, The Untouchables, and Princess Bride. Well done. Thank you. I know as we were like preparing for this episode, you're saying, you're like, oh my God, there's so many options. Well, there's, there is a lot. I mean, there is. So just some other like things to bring up. So I watched Cry Freedom for this too, yep. which is Denzel's role. That movie, I mean, that movie was really good. I wouldn't have had a problem. I think that movie was like underrated. It only got a couple nominations. The highlight being um, Denzel getting Best Supporting Actor nomination. I mean, Kevin mm-hmm. Klein is the lead in that movie. He's great. I mean, I... Not I didn't squeeze him in for a nomination, but if he would have gotten a nomination, I would have had no problem with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, to get ready for this, I watched, rewatched The Last Emperor, watched uh, Moonstruck, watched uh, Fatal Attraction, uh, Empire of the Sun, all for the and Cry Freedom, all for the first time. Uh, but I had already seen movies like The Untouchables and Princess Bride and things like that, so I came in prepared this time. You know, a lot of good movies that came out this year, like I mentioned, La Bamba, Dirty Dancing was a big hit that year, too. La but... Bamba. I love La Bamba. Mm-hmm. It's a good movie. Yep. Dirty Dancing, not as great. I feel like when I first saw that movie, I was, I, my expectations were probably set like really high, but I didn't think that movie was... Uh... So again, it's kind of like Fatal Attraction. It's like a popcorn flick type movie. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Exactly. Okay, moving on to our top five. Yes, in honor of The Last Emperor, we are going through our top five biopics. Now, for me, this was a hard list to narrow down. So, uh, if we have time, I have plenty of honorable mentions to discuss. My number five biopic is Cinderella Man. Russell Crowe plays uh, boxer James Braddock, uh, like in the Great Depression. One of my like go-to movies I don't know I just I love that movie so much uh Renee Zellweger plays his wife it's just it shows him kind of struggling you know obviously through the great depression he's trying to be this boxer and it's a great 
great story, great movie, just makes you feel good. And that's where, like, the whole, like, Cinderella story supposedly comes from. Like, they refer to this guy as a Cinderella man. So, um, like, when you hear sports talking about, like, underdogs, Cinderella story, that's kind of where this started. So, for me, that's my number five. Nice. I know that's one of your favorites, so that makes sense. Great movie. So, to narrow this down a little bit more for me, Mm -hmm. because there's so many biopics out there. So many. I said, for my list... I'm only going to have movies where the character starts out as a kid and Ooh. then becomes older. Okay. So, just a heads up. So, that is not going to include movies like Cinderella like Man. Like Cinderella Man, that's like a one, two year span, yeah. if even. Yeah, yep. and it's also not going to include movies like Schindler's List and Amadeus. So, just an FYI. Okay. That's going to happen for me. I like so, that. That's a good take on the list. Because you're right, there's so many biopics yeah. to choose from. So, don't fucking at me. <laughs> I miss these because the last list I put out when I asked people to like, oh, share what your top five. All I fucking got was people going, oh, how isn't the Blues Brothers on your list? Listen, it's not on my list and I don't need to hear you say that to me. <laughs> just give me yours. So yeah, that my list just from kid to adult specifically to narrow Perfect. it down a little bit. Okay. So for number five and because I didn't have a lot of time to think about it, my number five is The Last Emperor. Beautiful. I mean, he, it, works. it goes from three years old to death. I mean, it covers awesome. so much time and it won Best Picture. It's a phenomenal movie. That's my number. I don't need to go into too much more about it because we just talked about it for how long. But yep. that's my number five. Exactly. Um, my number four is Hidden Figures. Um, it is one of my favorite like recent biopics. Um, that's the story of uh, Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn, Mary Jackson, um, three uh, black women who worked for NASA in the 60s um, working as computers like literally computing things by hand that was like my first blown away moment in the movie when i see a science of the computers i'm like why are there no like machines and then i realized the people that's what they are are the computers yep um so yeah that's you know traji p henson octavia spencer janelle monet play those three women i don't know how we made it this far without ever having heard of their story but i love that movie so number four for me is hidden figures all right, so my next, uh, my number four is Malcolm X. Okay. Uh, he isn't a kid at the start of it, but he is like a young man yeah. uh, playing a pimp, of all things, Malcolm X. That's what he was. And then, you know, it spans over decades and decades of him going to prison and, you know, uh, going through all the religious beliefs and differences and the activism and, you know, calmly with his death. So that's my number four. Uh, Denzel Washington, Spike Lee joint. I mean, I think that's Denzel's best performance i know go back and listen to the 1992 that was only a couple episodes ago uh when we reviewed unforgiven mm-hmm. i'm pretty sure i gave denzel the win in 1992 uh, for his performance uh he's phenomenal in it uh my number three you already kind of mentioned this uh schindler's list is my number three um that was obviously the focus of one of our episodes uh best picture winner 93 is that right yes 93 um, just, uh, in an incredible story. So how, how can I not have Schindler's List yeah. in here? Uh, my number three is Walk the Line. Oh, nice. So yeah, starts out with him as a kid, little a RJ growing oh, up. Yeah. And then, uh, I think that's Joaquin's best performance. I know he won an Oscar for Joker last year, which I didn't love, but I think Walk the Line, him as Johnny Cash is his best performance. <laughs> so and good. They even made a parody of it with Dewey Cox. Walk hard. I mean, yeah, yeah. you know it's a good movie if they're making a parody on it. For sure. Exactly. Um, my number two is Aaron Brockovich. Um, just hands down, just a phenomenal movie, a great story about a great woman who continues to just work so hard um, for like water treatment, water cleanliness. So, uh, fantastic person to have. Um, a story about, and I just, uh, I just watched the movie and just, oh, you just feel so awesome. So Aaron Brockovich, my number two. Uh, plus, the Aaron Brockovich was in an episode of Shit's Creek. They were watching that movie. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> oh my God, that show. Yep, good stuff. My number two is Goodfellas. So it's Henry Hill. I love the beginning of it where he's a kid, the flashbacks where it's him like, loving and stylizing the gangster life and then it's him later on i mean that i think the movie spans over like 30 years 20 some years of life in inside the mob uh and then it ends with him you know going into witness protection uh i think that's martin scorsese's best film and yeah got it my number two all right 
Um, my number one would actually uh, qualify for your list because it starts with this person as a kid through current. Um, this movie makes me cry every time. I love it so much. It is so heartwarming and heartbreaking all at the same time. And it is Lion. Mm-hmm. Love, 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 love that movie. It's such an incredible story about how this kid um, manages to get lost and... 20 plus years later, he uses Google Earth and finds his little village that he grew up in and his mom and sister still live there. And it's incredible. And Dev Patel is so good in that movie. I love it. I'm like getting chills right now talking about it. I love that movie. It's so good. I do have got little goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> so Lion is my number one. All right. All right. Nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, my number one is City of God. Nice. Uh, so yeah, choice. Rocket. I mean, I love that movie too, how it's broken up in different time. Uh, frames as well as him as a little kid maybe not necessarily an adult but i mean it goes through years and years of his life in the slums uh in the city of god and yeah that movie is phenomenal i know we've talked about on this podcast already it's a 10 out of 10 for me uh so yeah that's my number one some that didn't quite make the list but did follow the caveat that i put in would be like ray Mm -hmm. i mean that starts out with ray charles as a kid and then you know onward from there I thought Catch Me If You Can was a close one. Um, it, you know, he is a kid in the beginning of that, even though it's Leo playing the same role uh, at all ages. But if I wouldn't have had that caveat, I probably would have had Amadeus at number one. But sure, okay, I didn't include it on my list. <sighs> I, we've yet to come across that one in our yeah. best picture watching. Um, yeah, some others that I had. Um, it was really hard for me keeping... Uh, Beautiful Boy out of the top five. That was, I feel like, kind of an underrated, um, not very widely seen, but that's one with uh, Steve Carell and Timothy Chalamet. Um, where, yeah, he's like this, you know, kid addicted to drug to drugs, and it was just such a beautiful movie, really touching. I like that. 12 Years a Slave is fantastic. Mm-hmm. October Sky. Moneyball? We just watched yeah. him a breakdown of Moneyball not too long ago. I feel like that's... I, I saw some lists just kind of, like, helping me, you know, refresh, like, okay, what are, what are some good biopics? I saw Moneyball and Miracle come up a number of times. I'm like, okay, like, again, it's based on a true story, but it's not... The entire movie isn't all about Billy Bean. The entire movie isn't all about her, Brooks. So that's why those kind of stay out. But I do love those movies, so... Mm-hmm. Some other honorable mentions. Imitation Game by yeah. Alan Turing. Fantastic movie. Mm-hmm. So, so good. A lot of good ones out there. Gandhi... Yep. One Best Picture. Yep. I mean, a lot of One Best Picture, but that one... Yeah, there have out. been a number of biopics that won Best Picture. Braveheart, uh, Beautiful A Beautiful Mind. Mind. Yep. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, if you're looking for some biopics, those are uh, usually worthy of an Oscar nomination. A lot of them, I feel like. Yeah, and even for, like, Best Actor, I feel like the Academy likes going with people that are based on a real yep. person. Agreed. I feel like because they can just compare it to that real person. <laughs> I don't know. Exactly. You know, but... Sometimes it's fair, sometimes it's not. I say, I don't always love that. I I like a good original performance more than anything. But yeah, they tend to lean that way a lot. Like King's Speech. Oh, yeah. You know, is one. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying you shouldn't have won, but that's one where, like, that's a straight Oscar bait kind of movie. Yeah. Uh, Eddie Redmayne is a... That one I hate. (laughs) That one, we will get to it when we get to that Mm -hmm. year, but... I don't know when that'll be, so I'm just going to say it now. I do not like that movie, and I don't think Eddie Redmayne should have won that Oscar. Yeah, because that was for his role as uh, Stephen Hawking yeah. in Theory of Everything. So Not great. Yep, yep. Um, but anyway, that caps off our top five biopics. Yep. That also caps off our show. Yes. So well, What do we have coming up next? Our next one is, let me bring it up here. I think our next next best picture winner is Gandhi, is it not? No, because we thought it was, but there's one in between. One in between, okay. Gandhi is two from now. Because um, I, 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 these two are so similar in the sense that, yeah, they're both biopics about, um, you know, a- Asian men, <laughs> if I can say it like that. Does that sound bad? I don't know. <laughs> we'll let the public decide. Oh my god, I sound like a terrible person. 
Uh, no, Man for All Seasons. Man for All Seasons. Oh, I hated that movie. Yeah, that's very spoiler, spoiler alert. alert. That might be a short episode where we talk more about other things, but... Spoiler alert. Kind of a boring movie that I don't think should have won Best Picture either, so... But there you go, spoil- there's a biopic. Three biopics in, in a row. Um, so yeah, that'll be the next one. And then, uh, please check out our other shows. I mean, it's one subscription and you get all the shows, but we've got... Classic reviews, so we'll review like older movies that we've been watching. I mean, I say older with air quotes because some of them are like Any. early 2000s <laughs> yeah. and anything outside of the last couple of years. Uh, but we try to do those and some current buzz, which is like within the last five or so years. Uh, but also me and some friend Quinn and Bo, we've been doing uh, The Good, Bad, and the Garbage where we just pick random movies and talk about it. This last one was Drunken Master with Jackie Chan. We're going to go on a Jackie Chan kick for a couple. Uh, so check those out. Uh, subscribe to our social media. We're at Oscar Real Pod on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, please leave a you know five-star rating if you're on uh, iTunes or the Apple Podcast right now. Give a like to our YouTube channel where I'm posting those good, bad, and garbage uh, videos. So leave a like on those and, and subscribe to the channel. Uh, so yeah, that's all that... We've got from you, so from Matt and Haley, this has been the Oscar Real Movie Pod.